This is Dr. Nick Williams, and you are listening to The Changelog. Welcome to The Changelog, episode 0.5.0. I'm Adam Stachowiak. And I'm Wynn Netherland. This is The Changelog. We cover what's fresh and new in the world of open source. If you found us on iTunes, we're also on the web, thechangelog.com. We're also up on GitHub. Head to github.com slash explore. You'll find some trending repos, some feature repos from the blog, as well as our audio podcasts. And if you're on Twitter, follow Changelog Show, Changelog Jobs, and me, Adam Stack. And I'm Penguin, P-E-N-G-W-Y-N-N. This episode is sponsored by GitHub Jobs. Head to thechangelog.com slash jobs to get started. If you'd like us to feature your job on the show, select Advertise on the Changelog when you post your job, and we'll take care of the rest. Up this week, our friends at Pusher over in London, looking for someone that knows the evented scene. Experience with Node.js, Redis, and message queues are a big bonus. Uh, they prefer people that can work in the U.S. remote or in the London neighborhood of EC1. If you're interested, lg.gd slash 8c. If you're a software dev in the Toronto area, in the Python and PHP community, and love the fast-paced and creative environment of a startup, FreshBooks is looking for a disciplined developer who doesn't sneer at scripting languages but also knows their enterprise-level stuff. Check out lg.gd slash 8z. Fun episode this week. Steve and I sat down with Dr. Nick Williams, really funny Aussie from Down Under. Now lives in San Francisco, works at Engineard, big in the Ruby community, works on the cloud. You'll find out what that means. Um, he's keynoting at Red Dirt Ruby Conf. We'll be there doing a live episode. That is in April, April 21st and 22nd. Uh, prior to that, he'll be at CodeConf. Be sure and catch him there, as will our buddy Steve Klabnik. will be the official change law correspondent at GitHub CodeConf. And in March, March 11th through the 13th is the main conference, PyCon in Atlanta. Kenneth will be there, hopefully, with a big bag of change log tees. Absolutely. And a mic. And a mic. And for all of you, all you guys out there actually asking us for more Python, uh, hit up hit up Kenneth for that because uh, he can help us out there. And if you're going to be at PyCon and he's got a mic in his hand, go say hi. Say, I have this cool Python project and needs to be on the change log. Just grab me by the arm and say, interview me now. That's right. Interview him now. And this is episode 50, so this is a big thing for us. We're excited about uh, being on the air and thanking you for listening to us and supporting us all this time and thanks to GitHub and thanks to uh, all the people who have us promote their jobs and everything for readers and Win and the rest of the team for supporting us. It's been awesome. Thanks for putting up with us for 50 episodes. Hopefully here's a 50 more. All righty. What episode this week? You want to get to it? Let's do it. Chatting today with Dr. Nick Williams from Engine Yard. So, Dr. Nick, for those that don't know you, I want you to introduce yourself and your role over at Engine Yard. I am one of the early Rails developers and users and fell in love with Rails back in 2005 when Ajax came out and fell in love with Ruby and made lots and lots of little open source projects. Um, and I think lots of people have used at least one of them. So, um, I ended up finding my way over to Engine Yard over here in uh, San Francisco, America, which is not where I come from. And the uh, I now have the very cool job of both looking after our, our large open source pr- program over here, which is the Ruby NES, JRuby, Fog, um, and uh, you know, Rails in general, as well as our grants program. And uh, I also sort of take a developer advocate role here for our, for our products. Well, believe it or not, we have a lot of non-Rubyists that listen to this show. So what does Engine Yard specialize in? We specialize in Ruby, specifically uh, getting Ruby into the cloud. So for uh, Rails apps, Rack apps, Sinatra, Merb, um, we think there's a huge marketplace for just that you know, that niche in of itself. Um, so uh, we, we essentially deploy to two different uh, infrastructures, which is the fancy phrase for, for Amazon and Terramark. Uh, because, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of people don't even know that Terramark exists and why, because there's just different different customers have different reasons for, uh, for different needs of their infrastructure, and Amazon doesn't provide all of them. So you say cloud. Oh, I know, heard... cloud. Isn't that a cool name? 
I've heard of a hundred different definitions <laughs> for drive, cloud. You I'm drive always... down the you know the 101 here in in uh, in, San, in in out of San Francisco, and uh, you know there's big billboards with the word cloud on it, and Microsoft attempting to tell you what cloud is. Um, <laughs> Uh, so essentially, cloud is uh, – I trivialize it for my own amusement. Cloud is is, is the shiny new name for the, this thing we call the internet. But um, what it is is, is allowing us to uh, provision you know, resources, like compute resources, uh, storage resources via APIs and, and pay for them on a sort of a rental basis, which means that you don't have to go off to Dell and, and fill up the back office or fill up a data center with machines um, – in case you might get traffic, you know you can start small and grow based on on uh, success of the business or the traffic that you drive, uh, which is really really important for uh, for nearly every you know uh, app that's being built these days. The whole world's moving to cloud, and uh, um, but that doesn't make it necessarily easy. It just means that you know you have to go there. Yeah, that's definitely true. I have a lot of friends who come from a non-web perspective, and they they do the standard uh, oh poo poo cloud you know kind of thing, and so we. We talk about this stuff a lot. I definitely uh, agree the cloud is becoming super important. You guys have done a lot of great stuff um, and historically have done a lot for Ruby. So uh, one of the things that's always interested me, I guess, about you, as long as I've known about you, is that uh, I mean, you have 154 public repos on GitHub. Like you said, you have a lot of open source projects and everybody's used probably at least one of them. And uh, I find myself in the same position. Like I literally wrote and released a tiny little Ruby gem last night after I was tired when I came home because, you know, there was some little idea that I wanted to, you know, bring up there. So how do you manage running that many projects and keeping abreast of if they get, need something? Do you sort of abandon a lot of old ones? Do you actively try to work on, you know, your older projects? How does that all work? No, I, I actively abandon them. I mean, <laughs> it, it, you just can't. I, mean, I think I did yeah. a talk. <laughs> I mean, it's – if you ever sit down and think about it, you mathematically just can't. I think I did a talk at uh, at Future Ruby, uh, which is, you know, which whilst a Ruby conference – had lots and lots of different content, and uh, I think all the talks for Future Ruby uh, were put on InfoQ, so you can go back and find those. A lot of a lot of interesting talks. The topic was that I talked about was was how you have a thousand projects, because I did this I did this back of a napkin type calculation after three years of doing open source. I had seventy five projects, and I, I sort of you know seventy five kind of realish projects, not just demo apps or something. And and I kind of figured you know if you did the maths and you had a job, did this for 40 years, which, you know, what we do in open source is, is wonderful. It's like being a garage mechanic, except you get to do it in public. You make shiny things and, and show, show them off and let other people use them. You know, why wouldn't you end up with a thousand projects? Um, and I, I quickly realized that was going to be disastrous for my, my social and, uh, and marital life. Yeah, so I had, to figure, I had to figure out what the solution to that problem was, um, and I figured it was worth sharing. And uh, active... Aggressive abandonment uh, is is an important uh, uh, part of that, uh, and that's only really possible now because of things like GitHub. But, you know, back in the subversion and CSV, uh, CVS days, you couldn't really just abandon projects, you know, um, and and assume that they might survive. But with GitHub, people can discover projects, people can fork them, have their own permission structures. Um, now, in Ruby, you're allowed to release gems in your own, even in your own name. I assume in different uh, you know communities or different uh, packaging environments, they'll have their own solution to that. So really in this modern world in you know, 2010, 2011, um, making projects as ideas and releasing them is, is – we're really enabled to do that these days. Yeah, I almost wonder, uh, having taken on two of Wise old projects, I almost wonder if that wasn't part of his his deal was having too many <laughs> things open at once because Hackney and Choose is a handful enough for me, you know, as it is. Not that I'm the same person Y as obviously, but uh, it's definitely uh, it's hard to to contribute to so many things at once. Uh, James Buck, who uh, created a project, he created a whole bunch of projects in his early Ruby days, but his most hugely popular one was a um, a deployment tool called Capistrano. Mm -hmm. uh, which which was the definitive uh, way that uh, Ruby applications got deployed, and um, uh, and then one day he publicly declared he was uh, abandoning the project, which I thought was you know, and he got massive feedback, you know, of praise and admiration and thanks, and I thought that was genius because it never occurred to me to publicly tell people I was <laughs> no longer going to work on something. Um, so I, was, I, was, uh, I thought that was pretty genius at the time. Um, so I, yeah, I think there's a lot of um, examples of people who start a wonderful project and uh, the, sometimes just the community just needs to know that they're allowed to participate. GitHub again has, has really, and that whole community notion has, has really been fostered around open source uh, and I think as less people need to be actually you know, explicitly told they can participate, I think more and more people know they can just fork, add features, send pull requests 
Um, so I think it's it's very healthy. I think these days to, to feel that you can just you know start a new project and know that someone will turn up and help. You know, Kenneth and Steve tell me I'm not a real developer till I get firmly in the world of Vim and leave TextMate behind. But I think I've discovered <laughs> you uh, via all your TM bundles. So is TextMate still your primary editor? Oh yeah. Um, look, okay, okay. So, do I have an issue with people going back to 1960s uh, technology? I don't actually know when Vim and Emacs came out, but I mean, Emacs is really old, isn't it? When it is. uh, Emacs is the canonical base of, of GNU, I mean, that was, you know, Stallman's big project. Um, but, you know, do I have an issue with people picking up legacy technologies? I mean, yeah, I do. I have a big issue with it. Do I, do I poo poo them publicly on, on, on public podcast radio? <laughs> I guess I just did. Um, but, well, Vim is 95 to defend right. it a little bit, if I that's remember right. correctly. Yeah, let's all go and get record players yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Windows 95 and, and, uh, and live the good life. Um, hey, Windows 95 is cool. You could, you know, put the Simpsons theme all over your, your machine. Anyway, um, but what's more important is that these people are aggressively trying to pick tools and, and, and chop and change their tool set that they use as developers. And if they think they're not getting the right, you know, if they don't feel enabled by TextMate, but they do feel enabled by Vim or Emacs, that's great, really, because that is, our, you know, if you're going to do this profession for 40 years and, and truly get the most out of it, you've got to constantly keep chopping and changing a tool set and find out what set of tools, languages, libraries, um, you know, and teammates that you want to work with. So best, on, you know, best of luck to them. Totally. I spend a lot of time SSH into servers, and so having one editor in most places is the main reason that I use Vim. But I just installed Janus uh, yesterday, actually, and uh, a friend looked over my shoulder and said, oh, so now your Vim is, is TextMate, basically. Um, and I thought that was really interesting. So I'm, And I have used TextMate uh, in the past. It's just, you know, I'm more used to Vim. So these, these wars will forever happen, the programmers arguing about tools. I'm really excited about Redcar uh, as well. Um, I know that uh, Engine Yard used to be involved with JRuby, but then that is not really happening anymore. And I know that, s- you know, sort of a segue. Still, no, we are still very involved with JRuby. So I apologize okay. if, if, if we haven't communicated our involvement <laughs> well enough. No, when uh, the three guys, Charlie, Tom, and, and uh, Nick left Oracle, they came to Engine Yard and we started um, ensuring that that work carried on. And, and uh, that's that we have that as a you know an alpha product at the moment for people to try. Um, but no, the world needs. I mean, Engine Yard needs more people using Ruby. That's our that's our belief. The, Ruby is a wonderful language. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're not anti polyglot, but I mean, as a base language for building web scale applications, which you know, it's the same for mobile, right? If you're building mobile apps, every app these days needs some sort of central back end, and we believe Ruby is is still the best uh, language and and has the best frameworks for doing that. So JRuby helps spread that message, and uh, it's also it's possibly, you know, the best VM it's in and of itself. I mean, I can say that today and it might change tomorrow, but I mean, it is the JRuby on top of the JVM is a tremendous product. Totally. Um, the segue to that, I guess, was uh, Red Car. So have you, have you tried it? Uh, I, have, in the I don't think of I've tried it. Like, it, it. It's actually very aggressively being developed. I think I played with it um, a few months ago. Um, I, at the time, I wasn't quite ready to give up TextMate itself, but I definitely understand what they're trying to achieve. Um, and the fact it that seems like it changes quite often. Yeah, like you said, it's definitely aggressively being developed. I had a friend give a presentation on my local Ruby Brigade about it, and the commands he had looked up the week before didn't work while he was giving his presentation because they changed the API. Yeah, um, that's that, that's awkward for demoing. Um, and and if it, again, if it means that, like Emacs, it's built in a language that you can hack and you can modify, that's very empowering for, for a lot of developers. So I'm, all, you know, especially you with what we've lived in the, the dark ages of TextMate, which is, I think, why many people leave TextMate. It's not because there's anything necessarily wrong with it. They are just fed up with lack of, you know, activity on the, you know, from, from the public eye. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, Red Car being written in a language that, even if you're not a Ruby developer, I mean, just knowing that it's written in a language that you could learn and that you could modify and you can contribute to um, in the editor itself. Obviously, it has bundles as well, like TextMate and, uh, and all the other editors, I think is, is going to empower it greatly. So I look forward to them getting to, uh, to a stage where the world starts to realize it is a wonderful editor uh, and gets a lot of traction. Well, you also do Objective-C development, right? I dabbled. I was a dabbler. I mean, <laughs> Oracle, uh, Oracle uh, Apple, you know, is there a difference? No. So when they, 
um, when when the iPhone SDK came out, I started. I just happened to be playing with uh, Ruby Coco. This was 2007. Um, Ruby Coco and. Uh, and so I was very desperate to figure out, could I get Ruby running on, on the iPhone? Unfortunately, I just wasn't clever enough to solve that problem. I, I'm just not a C person. I'm just... Have you ever... 2007, I got a linking error. I didn't realize people still had <laughs> linking errors. That was weird. I felt like... I know Objective-C is this beautiful um, syntax re- relative to the underlying language. But uh, yeah, I, was, I, I, I wasn't ready for a linking error. Uh, emotionally, but no, I, I, I did some Objective C back in 2005 and uh, 2007, and, and made a bunch of Ruby test libraries to sort of make it easier to to test your Objective C. Um, and uh, my consultancy at the time did did a bunch of uh, iPhone work. Um, but I was pretty f- annoyed by Apple's anti open source, you know, its approach at the time because they had that NDA in place, and so a whole bunch of Objective C people just wouldn't talk to each other. iPhone developers wouldn't talk to each other because they're all scared of Apple. What did Objective-C uh, cause you to appreciate about Ruby? Um, that is an excellent question. And I say it's an excellent question because I don't know what the answer is. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, well, we think for a grand a lot of things in Ruby, you know, just like string concatenation, right? I, look, I'm very excited C. about MacRuby. I mean, MacRuby yeah. is, is sort of blending the two things together. Um, yep. And I believe it's going to become uh, – I mean, I have heard whispers and ideas that it may become a first-class language in line. Um, and that'll be very exciting for uh, for anyone that wants to do, uh, uh, you know, sort of um, application development for the Mac without having to go down to the Objective C level. Um, and it looks very similar. I mean, I think I even created a Mac a TextMate bundle for, for Mac Ruby so that you could copy documentation in and generate Mac Ruby syntax. But um, uh, so I, I what did I learn? I I learned appreciation for all the things that I, I no longer have to think about. Managing memory. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Just remember yeah, what did I, I do I with that object. I have an object that. lying around here somewhere. What did I do with it? I don't even remember that. Is, uh. I was very excited to see Engine Yard team up with Accelerator for uh, mobile apps. So I guess you guys are providing plumbing for back end API type steps for. Again, uh, I mean, you really, what's the? There aren't many iPhone uh, sort of mobile apps that have a significant purpose in the world if they're not going to have a back end. Uh, and making it easy for, for people. Rails makes it easy to build that middleware layer, uh, or Rails or, or Ruby and Rack make it easy. Um, getting it up and, and running uh, in a production environment. You, I mean, if your app's going to take off, then you need to make sure your back-end scales. Um, so we worry that, that uh, people are making some awesome apps, you know, mobile apps, but don't have the expertise to ensure that their app doesn't look ridiculous because their back-end failed. So it's pretty important that... Um, that those guys get the support they need. So, yeah, it's, we're very cool, very excited that Accelerate. They're doing some very cool stuff. So, uh, Rails installer, I've been spending a lot of quality time with the Ruby installer project lately, and uh, it's been great. Uh, Luis took a couple hours on a Saturday to help me with some, some things involved with it, and it's been a great project, and so I'm excited to see uh, Rails installer bringing the same kind of thing. Um, one of the things I saw him say was that he's sick of people saying that the answer to Ruby on Windows is install Ubuntu in a VM. Yeah, and so it would be that's... great to have Rails actually be a first-class citizen on Windows. As much as I hate Windows, uh, there are people that love it. And so getting Rails to them is, is a good thing overall. So um, I guess congrats on that project. Uh, it, it's it's a really a important now. project. I mean, people just... Neat. I'll, t- I'll tell you a funny story. So, a funny story. If you go to the uh, Rails 3 guide, which I think is at guides.rubyonrails.org, and, and you go to you know, how to get started on Windows, the answer to that problem was a project called Instant Rails. And uh, Instant Rails was how I got started in Rails back in 2005. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. it hadn't been maintained since 2007. Uh, yeah. It was distributing a version of Ruby that didn't work with Rails 3. And so, what you had was people being told that if you're on Windows to go and install a set of software that didn't work with Rails 3. Um, so it was pretty much low-hanging fruit, really, for, for a project that needed doing. Um, really, really important. And uh, so now that if you go to the Instant Rails project, it now says, you know, please use you know, Rails installer. But all we did was we packaged up like a gift bag of, of things that we think make your life as a Ruby, Rails Ruby developer um, functioning and, and uh, pleasant. So it's not just the fact that it bundles Ruby installer, it's that it includes Git. 
it's that it attempts to set up, you know, future versions are going to set up your SSH keys um, and your Git config and just, you know, get you not just ready to be a Rails developer. Um, so it's going to, uh, it, like it includes my uh, SQLite, not just SQLite gem, but also SQLite itself. So, um, you know, you're just ready. You can, you don't have to go and look any further, but it also, once you take that next step and you want to start getting other gems or get source, participate in the GitHub, you know, centric community, you're ready to rock and roll because, um, we just want to lower the barriers to people participating. Yeah, that's awesome. I, uh, I actually wish that I had remembered that over the last couple of days. So, uh, we're actually, the shoes project is built with Ruby installer. And so I'm essentially doing the same kind of deal, all these extra recipes on top of Ruby installer. And so, uh, a lot of the same things are there, Git, SQLite, all those things. So yep. I probably could have gotten some help from looking at your code. Uh, so um, I mean, Luis is, I, I mean, I, he's I, fantastic. I, I, nothing bad ever happens to Luis. He, he is a machine. <laughs> I'm, sim, similar to, I remember I accused Charlie Nutter once of, of there being three of him because he seemed to be available and online helping 24 hours a day. And I think Luis is just a phenomenal human being um, for, for the effort he puts in and his knowledge about the, you know, the, the Ruby ecosystem uh, of software. And uh, if there's a bug, he kind of knows where that bug is most likely to exist. Uh, the fact that he's now on Ruby call to be able to look after Windows is, is, is very enabling and wonderful. Um, no, so it was, uh, uh, he was our jungle guide when we were building uh, the Rails installer. Yeah, I talked to him once, and then he spent six hours on a Saturday helping me fig find an obscure bug in uh, in Ruby, and then said, "Oh, I'm sorry, I need to go now. My fiance is going to be mad at me or something." So he's just he's totally he's a machine. It's great. Yeah, we um, need to have some words with his for fiance. I, I hope she <laughs> understands how how what he does, how valued and appreciated. We're hoping that he's going to be coming up to Ra RailsConf. Um, so if if you have no other reason for for Ruby developers come to RailsConf, it's to come and see Luis. Uh, and at least to thank him for what he does. Speaking of conferences, you are speaking at CodeConf, right? Oh, I am. And that's going to be exciting. I even know what I'm going to talk about now. <laughs> <laughs> I could be accused of many things, and definitely one of them is to pick my topic of, 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 a, of a talk you know, as late as possible, where the, the conference organizers get really cranky and say, Nicholas, we need... They never say Nicholas. That's my mother. They'll say, Dr. Nick, we need... Uh, and my mother doesn't run conferences, so it's Dr. Nick. Dr. Nick, we need to know what you're talking about. Um, but it's, in this case, I actually went over to GitHub yesterday, and Chris and I nutted out uh, a talk idea, and that's going to be around the, the tool set I, theme that we sort of you know, talked about here earlier on the, on the podcast. Um, just the importance of constantly evolving and picking your tools and uh, building your own, looking at what other people are using, why it is okay to use Vim, even though I personally dislike it. Uh, I mean, if you have to put the shortcuts on a coffee mug, <laughs> I don't know. I just think that's, that's, there's something for us to learn from that. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm excited for CodeConf, and uh, one of the interesting things about it I noticed that's great, uh, it seems like, someone said, it seems like every Ruby con uh, conference has to have some sort of controversy, and so uh, the Ruby con or CodeConf is going to have like 40, 30, 40% women speaking, and uh, not to broach the whole you know, women CS, oh my god, topic, but I think that's going to be really uh, exciting, and it looks like we've got a great lineup, so uh, you know, I'm excited to go to it. And, and I don't, uh, yeah, I don't think it's else. a pure Ruby conference. I, I think people are talking about other languages, other stuff. And, and, There's uh, lots of JavaScript. Uh, yeah. Jash Eschenankis, or however you say his last name, uh, is going to be talking. Ashkenaz, that's right. I butchered it more than anybody. I remember you guys talked to him, you had a conversation about this. I believe your now, show actually. has talked about his projects more than anyone else, so if anyone <laughs> <laughs> going to get his name pronunciation correct. Uh, it would be you guys. Uh, yeah. He's done some so, wonderful stuff. I mean, the, the, the document cloud, he works over at the document cloud. Right. Yeah, yep. I mean, they've done some awesome projects that have come out of there um, before and after CoffeeScript. Docco so. is great. Yeah. Uh, I'm really, really uh, happy with it, even though I wrote a blog post that said I sort of wasn't almost. Um, it's great. It's been fantastic. I've been using it for every yeah, project the, since. The, 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 uh, the cloud crowd project, um, the underscore one. So you know, my whole bunch Coffee of Coffee script is my favorite. Oh, absolutely. It goes with that. I mean, it just, you know, it'd be, it's a brilliant invention. Um, very glad. Makes me very So if happy. you just now picked your uh, topic for CodeConf, I guess you don't have a clue what you're going to talk about at uh, Red Dirt? Uh, Red Dirt I, the Red Dirt, uh, Ruby Nation, and uh, RailsConf, I'm going to go with the, the Rails installer theme. I've never really gone with, with giving the same talk at multiple conferences, but unfortunately, yeah, I say unfortunately, this would be awesome. I get to get better at it. But this message about Rails installer, which is um, getting the Rails developers to 
get back out and you know sharing Rails again. It's, I mean, Rails Installer is obviously a tool for new people, but it's also a tool for current Rails developers to be able to share Rails with confidence, which is why we're building an OSX and, and probably a Linux one, um, so that you can point to it, this one URL and say, this is, and say with confidence, this is the place you go to to get started in Rails and have a happy experience. Um, I mean, that's one of the reasons Google took off is, you, you know, you could share the Google address with someone and have confidence that people, your friend, your mother, your, you know, siblings were going to have a positive experience um, searching the internet. Uh, so we, kind of, we want Rails installer to have that same um, message. When you talk about going to multiple conferences to speak to get that message out there, it actually draws back to one of the things that's sort of a problem with Rails, and I wonder if you know how this is going to be fixed in the future, is that we sort of have developed a culture of, so if you just read these like 15 blogs, you'll get all the documentation and all the knowledge about what's going on and what you should be using. And I've had problems in the past with people Googling answers, and since Google's page rank accumulates links over time, you know, you'll get answers from... Oh, there's some classic 2006 now, articles that you just must read. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> So how is Rails going to overcome that in the future? Do you think? That is, uh, and, and, and that is certainly one in the mission statement of Rails Installer from the website perspective is to try to, to bring that together, um, you know, the getting started information. Um, but, I mean, that's not to take away from, from some of the the, um, the textbooks that have been written, like the Rails Freeway and uh, um, uh, the one Ryan Big and, and Yehuda wrote. Um, you know, I mean, the people are putting a lot of effort into those and, and, you know, paying 30 bucks for books to get the, you know, rock solid getting started experience. A whole bunch of people are doing training. I mean, Engineer University exists on top of other people doing, you know, the, the Rails tra uh, training uh, podcasts and, and peep code, etc. cetera. Um, a bunch of different, you know, getting started experiences. Um, so I do want to make, yeah, that is definitely the mission statement though, to, to bring that all together so that people can get started. We may even put it into the bundle it in ourselves. So that's you know, everything's work. We have to <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you don't have too many good ideas versus a capacity to execute. So, um, but no, the, lots of people making that much easier. Um, but if we can stop people going to Google for answers, the the longer the better. And if we can keep people on Windows, the longer the better. So <laughs> I don't want people to think that they need to go and buy a Mac because then they stop being experts on Windows and the community dies. Question from Twitter. Casey Carroll wants to know your thoughts on the Jenkins-Hudson drama. The, well, I think it's, look, I think it's a wonderful lesson to, 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 uh, to businesses involved in, in uh, open source that, that they, they very likely don't get it. I mean, so Engineer has an experience with open source. Um, we currently don't really lay any claims over trademarks or IP on, on uh, Rubinius or JRuby or FOG or any of the projects that we've sponsored full time, uh, which included Rails till recently. Um, you know, we, we contribute to them because they're part of our, our product or a part of the community that, that uses those things. Oracle, you know, bought this huge company called Sun, which was the largest owner of, of open source, I think, in the, uh, you know, owner, so to speak, the largest orchestrator of open source. And... You know, they're having some teething problems figuring out what do they do with those assets. Um, and they've... Sorry. <laughs> they're coming for you. <laughs> we'll just have pause. It's the Oracle police. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had someone what? that says Oracle's new open source strategy is to find every single developer and just kick them in the balls. And that's their new like initiative going forward to you the, know reach uh, out to the community. Yeah, perhaps they'll perhaps they'll have little booths at at, um, at shopping centers where you can, as a developer, come and have your balls kicked. <laughs> <laughs> I had an idea for Netflix, completely off the topic. I went to a Netflix talk. Uh, and we'll get back to Jenkins. Um, yeah. Well, I went to a talk on uh, NoSQL at Netflix the other night down in um, it was actually the Facebook office. Uh, it was the uh, San Francisco. It was, what is it? The Bay Area cloud computing. One of the multitude of cloud computing things, uh, meetups. And um, and I just I was I had this cool idea of Netflix, wherever they go and talk, they should have these like cardboard post box, you know, like a blue or red uh, mailbox that they could put at the front of the room. And people just know that if you're going to see a Netflix talk, you can take your Netflix DVDs with you and drop them off there. Because, you know, who's got time to go to the post these days? And I, I thought that would be a cool <laughs> idea. I saw a really ridiculous thing, thing about the Facebook login controversy with people, again, using Google inappropriately, where uh, I guess Redbox has received a number of complaints of people thinking that they're Amazon just because they're both red and they're both DVDs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, or, Am- or maybe it was the other way around. Maybe it was Amazon or uh, the, the people trying to return their red box things in their uh, Netflix papers. But I thought that was like – it's something we have to overcome as developers, you know, is like getting out to people and having them understand this stuff. Um, so, so Jenkins, back to Jenkins. So what do I think? I think it is um, – show, it shows just the power of the tools and the power of the community to decide that, um, that, that you can fork something. I mean, forking and, when renaming wasn't just you know, Jenkins itself. It was every plugin. I mean, every right. plugin has, has um, essentially had to fork itself, rename itself, then go back to the original um, mailing list or original project and say, I no longer want to be a contributor. I mean, as a grassroots – movement it was it was um, exceptionally well executed um and i don't know that uh, oracle's really left with anything that they aren't trying to you know make up themselves um but it was very disappointing i mean it was annoying that oracle first went and got the trademark that they realized they didn't have um they weren't really putting any resources into it except turning up to meeting the one meeting i went to for hudson and they had an oracle representative there everyone assumed they had the brand the trademark but it turns out they didn't right up until they decided that they were going to you know, start meddling. Hmm. So, have you seen Travis? Do I, this is a product because I don't know anyone called Travis. <laughs> have you met Travis? It's a, it's a very it's social a very conversation. Alpha. No, but uh, what about Barry? Uh, so yeah. it's... <laughs> no, Travis just dropped. I guess uh, this last week. It's a very alpha distributed uh, continuous uh, integration for Ruby. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, I do remember oh, yeah. the, the, the name. No, I haven't played with it. I, I, I um. Um, I'm, I'm, I must admit, I've, I've kind of made decisions around about this, and people should just use Jenkins and be done with it. <laughs> I mean, it works; it's rock solid. Um, they've got the plugins. We are, there's um, uh, there are people building JRuby plugin for it. Um, the frontier uh, front side, are, uh, but anyway, uh, Charles Lau and uh, his brother are building a JRuby plugin, so people can write plugins that are in Ruby. Um, and no doubt, the work they do there will make it easier for people to write in other languages as well. It is just a rock-solid uh, CI um, workflow engine. People are building businesses on top of Jenkins that aren't, you know, continuous integration. They're using it for its workflow engine. Um, huh. So I, I get it that people that building your own CI tool, and this is no, I, I, this is only slightly disrespectful to, to, to everyone else that's building their own. I get it. I mean, I've certainly built my own stuff, um, but I, I implore uh, real. That companies that that have projects that need a, a CI uh, need a continuous deployment p- solution, I implore them to at least investigate Jenkins. Um, if we can all just agree that this thing is awesome, um, and we start making our open source contributions around that product, I think we'll all get a tremendous outcome. I get nothing out of it. I just think it's 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 important that we all sort of focus our energies. Uh, I also need to get Ruby developers to get over this whole Java thing. Yeah. Um, so I guess one more general uh, open source question. Uh, I've had a lot of people um, – actually, I got, I got two or three patches to a couple of my projects in the last week, and people said, um, please uh, be, be – uh, I guess I want to say careful or like this is my first patch, so I apologize if something is wrong. And they were like incredibly uh, you know, tenuous about their contribution. So uh, what do you think the open source community can do to actually encourage people to get into open source and contribute? I mean, this has been sort of a long you know, question, but... Um, I, think, uh, I think we should always remember that we're lucky that open source exists anyway, um, and that's full of, of, of disparate humans who all have different motivations, and, 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 and some days we're happy and some days we're sad. Some days our wives appreciate what we do, and some days they get annoyed at us. Um, and that if you don't get the, you know, if if you make your first contribution to to a project and you don't get the positive, warm, loving cuddle that you expected or thought you sh- you might get, um, don't don't give up. You know, not, <laughs> not everyone's going to get back to you. If you contribute to one of my projects and you don't hear back from me for for six to twelve months, um, that is unfortunate. Uh, and so I assume that, <laughs> that I'm just catching that for myself. Um, it is not that I don't like you or don't know who you are or whatever. Um, if I'm not using that project, it's really hard for me to validate the, the, the merit of, of your patch. Um, but, I mean, just keep contributing. Understand that you, that's, that's your first step to, you know, of, of, of 10,000 contributions. Um, and uh, I, I am very glad. I, I, I wish there was like a badge that you could get. I made my first commit. It probably is one of those little badges that you can get. Uh, it was a wonderful experience and I, I, I must admit, I forget what it's like to make my first contribution. It was back in, 
the subversion days. I remember I had to figure out how subversion worked. There was, yeah. there was, a, there was a big, there's a big learning curve just to making your first contribution to go from being a user of libraries to becoming a contributor to libraries. Um, Definitely. I, mean, I, I think I wrote a blog post that's very old and tired, and there's probably better ones now. But um, I just uh, for the people making the contributions, keep you know, it, I, I I employ you to do it. I mean, I know that we a lot of employers are certainly here at Engine Yard. We look at GitHub um, accounts, we look at your commits, look at your projects, you know, because we want to see what you're interested in, what you're capable of. We want to see that you've taken that that manly step. I don't, I don't mean manly, uh, sorry, in the sense of, of gender, that maturity step of, of knowing that you can contribute beyond just your own code base, that solving the, your own application problem sometimes involves fixing other people's stuff um, because that's, that shows initiative. Um, so. Do you think the uh, open source portfolio is the new developer resume? Yep, absolutely. I think I, I know there was a project recently, that uh, GitHub resume project, that was kind of cute. Um, yeah. I don't think that's the, the end of it, um, but uh, it might be cool for people who had tag. This is my favourite commit, um, <laughs> mm. but uh, I think that uh, certainly it's um, it's a starting point for for real conversation. But it's also you know getting out, learning the, how to talk in front of public, going and talking at local groups about your project, communicating um, why you did something. I think that is that is how you're going to get real jobs and real distinction. Um, contributing is, is is one part of that. Contributing code is one part of that. Contributing uh, at meetings, helping run meetings, each of those is valuable and gives you uh, visibility. And you know, and with visibility comes opportunities. What's been your biggest adjustment to life in the northern hemisphere? Well, it took me a few weeks, but uh, I now drive on the correct side of the road. <laughs> Um, that's that's not obvious. Uh, those multi-lane freeways are really quite treacherous if you're on the wrong one. Um, uh, you flash your headlights, uh, but nothing changes. They get really angry at you. Um, I actually got my, my temporary driver's license the other day. Biggest adjustments um, is dealing with my children's accents changing. <laughs> huh. Dealing with them picking up new words that, uh, you know... We always we thought accent might be the issue, but then coming back with with all the American phrases uh, and then pronunciations, that's actually that's a bit of an adjustment. It is weird realizing that we are the foreigners in someone else's country. <laughs> now we've lived overseas, so this is not that that, that new to us. But hearing our children uh, evolve so quickly is is uh, emotionally challenging. And you've got a new addition. We as do, well, right? Uh, and uh, three week old Charlie, his his uh, accent is still pretty rock solid Australian at the moment. Uh, he can do. <laughs> <laughs> like Australian, um, but uh, yeah, we, uh, yeah, we'll worry about him uh, in a year's time when he starts. Because <laughs> we were tweeting back and forth about a post I did on the changelog, and then I found out later that everybody's congratulating you on the, yeah, the new edition. Be, and you... <laughs> it was I was actually in a hospital, so for for the listeners, so um, yeah, there was the post. What was it? It was just inappropriately titled. It was a post of really, it was a list of re- things people should do in their project. But then you put That's some correct. wacky title on it, like <laughs> "I'm not going to use your project unless you do the following." <laughs> you know, blah blah it blah. Works. Sucks to be you. Um, but then your tweet <laughs> said something completely different, and so I was look. I was confused as to what message you were trying to convey. Uh, and yes, I did happen to be in the hospital, standing next to my wife, who had just been put into the you know the post delivery room. Um, it wasn't entirely the best timing, but you know, you started a fight on the internet, and I needed to. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I, uh, speaking of people that are tirelessly helpful, um, Wayne from RVM one time, I heard a podcast where he was giving an interview and they heard some typing and they said, Wayne, are, are you on IRC helping someone right now? And he was like, yeah, maybe. And I guess like while he was being interviewed, he was like helping somebody out fixing their RVM problem over on Freenode. I, uh, that is a, be a red dirt. Yeah, he'll be a red dirt. Um, I, I, yeah, so Wayne, uh, Wayne and I work together, obviously uh, in part on, on Rails install, but um, Wayne, Wayne's here at Engine Yard uh, doing some internal stuff as well um, for, for you know, customers and all the projects that are going on here. And, uh, and it is, he's a wonderfully energetic man. It's awesome to work with. I'm very glad he came back to Engine Yard. Um, I'm glad he's not somewhere else helping someone else. So what out there has got you excited? What open source do you just want to play with? The last month or so, I've been doing a couple of internal, uh, you know, projects that we're going to release to the customers. So I must admit that that's kind of, whilst it still has the excitement of building a new product and a project that I would have otherwise done anyway as a as a non, 
uh, company person. Um, I guess those have been my attraction. I, look, I'm pretty desperate to get my hands on some of this stuff around JRuby and Jetty. And uh, um, uh, Carl Lurch has been building a thing called Kirk, which is uh, uh, like a new web server for uh, for JRuby, which um, a whole bunch of you know zero deploy uh, invented. And uh, I think that's going to be very enabling. And hopefully, we can get it in our product if it's uh, you know help it get rock solid. Um, I want to learn more about all the fun stuff that's in the Java community that I get to, if I just knew what it was, because I, I'm like, okay, so here's <laughs> the problem. Hard. Right. Oh, I follow the, there's a Ruby gems, Twitter account. And all it is, is mm-hmm. all the things get released, which is mm-hmm. hundreds a day. I get it. Right. So my, my Twitter feed is half filled with, with these product announcers, but at least I'm, I'm, I have a vague awareness of what's coming out. Plus Ruby news and, and um, JavaScript, you know, retweets, etc. But I have no idea what, what the Java world is building. Therefore, what I'm not being able to use because I, I don't know about it. So that's that's the challenge with the JRuby project is it allows you to do all this stuff, but then you've kind of got to live in two communities to be able to take advantage of it. Um, and I, I, you know, this building massive web scale applications, I think, I think there's a bunch of cool stuff that I reckon we'll find over in the Java community if we were just to go and have a dig around. So, uh, what am I excited about at the moment? That's Kirk. What am I excited about in the future is finding more gold. Um, I'm also very still excited about about the Jenkins um, project. Um, I, I want to see someone lay the foundation. We have a CLI for that. It's a bit more sort of client Ruby orientated, so you can sort of point it at a project and go sort of Jenkins create dot, and it automatically creates a job and starts running your tests without doing any setup. That's very cool. Uh, so pushing that further out and sort of making you know continuous deployment easy. I just want testing to you know doing CI to be easier than not, to do than not to. Is that too much to ask? Seriously? <laughs> Indeed. If everyone writes tests, how many people have actually got functioning CI servers running? I mean, hearts, you know, promises that's look after, they care about it, and I don't think there's enough people. I think I think there's a lot of lip talk to this whole conversation. And part of it is it's still just not easy enough. And this is me looking at this Travis article that you guys did the other day. <laughs> and and you know, there's still steps and it's still you gotta set it up. Um and uh and maintain it. So, I think there's, you know, there's a there's a big space there to people make the world a better place, which is keeping keeping CI simple. Well, we know you're a busy man. Surely appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. Look on the Change Log Show. This is the biggest <laughs> show in the world at the moment. Thank you very much no. for inviting me. It's been awesome. 